uh, senators to take their seats, and I'll call Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I table for the information of the Senator revised ministry list. I seek leave to have the document incorporated into Hansard and to make a short statement. Order. Um, order. Senator Birmingham, leave is granted. Yes, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. I advise the Senate that the updated ministry list reflects the updated ministry announced by the Prime Minister on 22 June 2021 and the appointment of Mr. Joyce as the Deputy Prime Minister. Order. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hume. This morning on RN, the Minister for Environment, Susan Lee, refused to guarantee Mr. Morrison's preference for net zero emissions by 2050 uh, would survive Mr. Joyce's return as Deputy Prime Minister, saying, and I quote, we will have discussions with the nationals. Oh. <laughs> Order. Order. Senator McKenzie. Senator McAllister, please continue. Oh, wow. Have these discussions started yet? Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll take the question on notice. <laughs> Order. Senator McAllister, supplementary no, question. No, no, no. Minister Lay went on to say that, and I quote, of course, we want to reach net zero as soon as possible, and I don't think anyone in the government would disagree with that. Does anyone in the Morrison-Joyce government disagree with reaching net zero as soon as possible? Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr President. I can't imagine why anyone in the government would not want to reach net zero emissions as soon as possible. Senator Order, Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Uh, National Senate Leader Senator McKenzie has said, and I quote, there is no agreement with the second party of this coalition government on any target date for zero emissions. In fact, it would fly in the face of the Nationals' public policy commitment. Is Senator McKenzie right? Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. I can't imagine why Senator McKenzie's response is in any way, shape, or form contradictory to that of which Susan Lee said this morning. Order, Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Order. Workforce, Skills, Small Order. Sorry, and Family Senator Brockman, Business. Please pause. I'd like to be able to hear Senator Brockman's question. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Cash. The mining sector generates billions of dollars of economic activity and employs hundreds of thousands of Australians. Can the minister inform the Senate how the Morrison government is securing our economic recovery by supporting jobs and investment in the mining sector, particularly in our home state of Western Australia? Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Brockman, a fellow Western Australian, for that question. And, uh, Mr. President, the Morrison government is committed to putting in place the right economic framework to support the creation of jobs in my home state of Western Australia, and indeed right across the economy. Mr. President, one of the things that we will do is support big job-creating projects, particularly in the mining and resources sector, because. Uh, the Morrison government understands the contribution that the mining and resources sector makes to not just Western Australia, and that's right, Senator Abetz, just like Joel Fitzgibbon, but also to Australia as a whole. We've already seen our economy rebounding back strongly after the COVID-19 induced recession. Unemployment is now down to 5.1 per cent. Underemployment is at its lowest level since 2014. In May, just last month, 115,000 new jobs were created. 85 per cent of those new jobs were full-time jobs, and 60 per cent of the 115,000 jobs went to women. But we also know there's still more work to do, and that's why the mining industry is in need of skilled workers. And what we're doing as the Morrison government is putting in place the right policy framework so that Australians can get the skills that they require to get into the mining sector. We're doing this in a variety of ways, Mr. President, including through our $1 billion job trainer fund, providing free 
or low-cost training in areas of labour market need, but also by extending the highly successful Boosting Apprenticeships Commencements Wage Subsidy. And, Mr President, we've also committed, as the Morrison government, to helping the mining sector by speeding up approvals for big projects and cutting red and green tape. And don't forget, Mr President, we're the side of politics that put forward reforms to greenfield agreements that would have given the mining industry certainty in terms Order, of their industry Senator, investment. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. I certainly do, Mr Order. President. Thank you. Can order the minister my, outline order, how Senator the Brockman, I'm going to ask you to start again because there was way too much noise there for me to hear his question. S really, Senator Ayres, I'd appreciate some respect to the chair. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline how the government's economic plan, including lower taxes, reducing red and green tape, and boosting skills and training, will provide greater certainty for mining investment and job creation? We're wasting time for the opposition, Senator Ayres. I'll call Senator, I'll call Senator Cash when there's silence. Senator Rennick, that's not helpful. He wouldn't be the first person that came to mind for interjections. Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, those on the other side make fun of jobs. It is a fact that we have record full-time employment in Australia. It is a fact that those on the other side recently voted against colleagues our amendments to ensure the definition of casual uh, was properly put, but also to put in place the pathway to permanency from casual employment. Those on the other side voted against it. They also voted against the reforms that we were putting in place to greenfields agreements to ensure greater certainty for the mining sector. And they have Order. the audacity to say that they're going to visit the great state of Western Australia. Mr Albanese said he's taking his shadow cabinet to the great state of Western Australia. Order. And guess what? They can't support reform to greenfields agreements. How can you possibly touch down in the great state of Western Australia? Well, you can. You can stand on a mine site in a high vis, but guess what? That does does not prove that you support the mining industry, and in particular when you don't support the cutting, as Minister Morton does, of red and green tape in the mining industry. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you. And this has probably been answered in, in ample amounts in the last couple of minutes, Minister. But can the Minister advise the Senate of Order. any risks to this important sector that would harm our economic recovery? Order. Order. Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, when Mr. Albanese touches down in Western Australia and the question is put to him, do you support the mining industry and will you support cutting red and green tape uh, in relation to the mining Order. industry, as Premier Mark McGowan does? Colleagues, as Premier Mark McGowan does, will he side with the people of Western Australia, with the Morrison government, with Premier Mark McGowan, or will he look Western Australians in the face and say, I do not support you? And you see, Mr Albanese, you can't just go to Western Australia, stand on a mine site, wear a bit of you know, high vis, and say he supports Western Australia. Order. Because you see, Mr President, there are list. policies that are here in this place, the Greenfields Agreement. We could bring that on tomorrow to show support to Western Australia, but also the cutting of red and green tape in the mining industry. So I look forward to Mr Albanese going to Western Australia and showing his clear support for the McGowan government and their calls supporting the Morrison government for cutting red and green tape in the mining sector. Before I order... Before I call the next question, I'd like to draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the gallery of the Ambassador of Slovenia to Australia, His Excellency Mr Yuri Riefel. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to the parliament and in particular to the Senate. Yeah. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. When asked in 2020 about a net zero by 2050 target, Minister Seselja said, it was reckless, and I quote, the sort of policy you would expect from a minor party like the Greens, but not a party who claims to be the party of government. <laughs> Is this still the minister's position? The Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Thank, I, thank, you, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Gallagher for the question. 
Uh, so when it comes to action on climate change, uh, our government uh, is well, no, well, it is actually. It's about it's about zero net emissions. Uh, that is actually about climate change, Senator. So sorry to break it to you, uh, but when it comes to that, uh, the Morrison government has, of course, signed on uh, to the Paris Agreement, uh, and the Paris Agreement outlines a number of important goals. It does. It outlines a number of important goals. It has things like a 2030 target, something that this government is committed to, a 26 to 28 per cent, uh, bringing down emissions, something we are well on track uh, to meet. Uh, it also talks about uh, getting to zero net emissions in the second half of the century. And Our Prime Minister has said uh, that we intend to get there as soon as possible, and preferably by 2050. Now, one thing, one thing that this government won't be doing, uh, and where we where we absolutely Order. Well, what Order is reckless, on my left. what is absolutely reckless is to make targets Order. or promises with no plan for how you're going to get there as on my opposite right. to. Yeah. Now what are the Labor Party going to do? They don't have a 2030 target because they don't want to tell us how they're going to get there. And when it comes to zero net emissions, they won't tell us. So what are we to take from that, Mr President? Well, it might be that they might go back to previous form. When they were in coalition with the Greens, what did they do? They brought in a carbon tax. That was their main method of bringing down emissions. We on this side, we on this side Order. are about technology, not taxes. Technology, not taxes. So investing in renewables, working in smart ways on new technologies like hydrogen, but not destroying jobs, be it in regional Order. communities, be it in Senators manufacturing, Green be it in the outer suburbs. Senator Green. This coalition government will stand for those things whilst Senator meeting Ayers. and beating our 2030 targets, as we are doing in contrast to many countries Order. around the world. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting, interesting answer. Can the minister confirm that the minister now supports the Prime Minister's preference for net zero by 2050? Can Senator Seselja. Support all policies of the government. Uh, absolutely all Order. policies of the government. Uh, as a proud member Order. of this coalition government, I tell you what, I support every one of them. Uh, because on the alternative. Left. The alternative over on that side of ever higher and higher taxes, of destroying jobs, whether it be in our regions or in our cities, of completely abandoning those people who the Labor Party used to pretend right. to represent uh, the working class. Order. You know, the working class, uh, people like me who came from relatively low income backgrounds, I tell you what, the alternative is you mob. And what are, what is, what are your alternative policies? Well, it might be to tax your way to your non-existent 2030 target or to your aspirational 2050 target, which you won't tell Order. us how you will get there. We've made it very, very clear that we will put on the table exactly how we're going to reach our targets. That's why we've been successful to date, and we will continue to pursue those kind of policies into the future. Order. Order. I'll call Senator Gallagher when there's order. We're wasting time for the opposition. On my right, it's not helpful when there's noise from my left. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Um, uh, my supplementary. In February, the Deputy Prime Minister wrote that, and I quote, the Nationals have always been opposed to a net zero target. If the Nationals supported net zero emissions, we would cease to be a party that could credibly represent farmers. Does the Minister support the Prime Minister or the Deputy Prime Minister? Senator Seselja. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, as, I, as I said earlier, as I said earlier, I support all policies of this coalition government. And, 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 and as, I, as I pointed to earlier, the fundamental difference, and, and what the Labor Party doesn't seem to understand, maybe, maybe the member for Hunter understands it, maybe there are some others, maybe Senator Farrell actually agrees with the member for Hunter, that you don't actually achieve good things for the environment by trashing jobs and trashing industries. I mean, if you look at, I mean, this is a party. This is a party that claims to support gas, uh, and yet the second we put forward a gas-fired generator that actually supports renewables, that actually backs up renewables, what does the Labor Party do? They oppose it. So uh, this side of politics will continue to 
meet and beat our targets, we'll continue to grow our economy, we'll continue to reduce emissions while protecting jobs, protecting livelihoods and growing Order. our economy, in stark Order. contrast to those opposite. Order. Order. It's on my left. Order, Senator Wong, Senator Abetz, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Environment Minister. After losing 50 per cent of the coral cover of the Great Barrier Reef since 2015, UNESCO has today recommended that the reef be listed as World Heritage in Danger, pointing out that climate change is the Order. biggest threat to the reef. They have warned Australia of this since 2012. Yet the minister today claimed to have been blindsided and stunned by the decision. How did the government manage to miss the memo that without significant action to address climate change, an in-danger listing was likely? Or is the minister just stunned that your Order eight years of lobbying right. other nations to ignore the science has finally failed? The minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Waters. Mr. President, the Morrison government is deeply committed to protecting the World Heritage-listed Great Barrier Reef. We fully recognise that the Great Barrier Reef is facing pressure from climate change and from other impacts, but we do not support the recommendation to immediately place the reef on the list of World Heritage in danger, and we will strongly oppose that recommendation. Mr. President, we think that this recommendation is premature and doesn't recognise the enormous efforts of the Australian and Queensland governments working with farmers, working with tourism Order. operators, traditional owners and communities right up and down the reef coast to protect the reef and supporting them with a $3 billion joint investment. The government has been stunned by the backflip on previous assurances from UN officials that the reef would not face such a recommendation prior to the UNESCO World Heritage Committee meeting that's being hosted by China this July. We are also concerned about a deviation from normal processes in assessing Senator World Wilson. Heritage Property Conservation status. The UNESCO draft decision has been made on the basis of a desktop review, with insufficient first-hand appreciation of the outstanding science-based strategies being jointly funded by Australian and Queensland government. Indeed, the last, visit, the last visit to the Great Barrier Reef by UNESCO officials was in fact in 2014. The Great Barrier Reef is the best managed reef in the world, and this draft recommendation has been made without examining Order, the reef firsthand and without the latest information. Indeed, uh, of the 83, 83, uh, uh, um, um, what are they called? 83 in danger um, uh, uh, properties that have been identified by UNESCO, this is in fact the only one that has been singled out, which, is, uh, which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Um, it is, in fact, uh, of the 83 properties that have been assessed, this is the only one that has been singled out. All properties could end up on that danger Order. list with Senator no prospect Hume. of any individual Time state party being able to get them off. Expired. Order. Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Yes, thanks, President. Your government's inaction on the climate crisis now threatens the 60,000 jobs that rely on the Great Barrier Reef. You won't commit even to net zero by 2050, and now the National Party certainly won't let you do that. But the rest of the world is focused on 2030, and the G7 has called for strong 2030 targets and no new investment in fossil fuels. When will you put the interests of the environment, the economy and our tourism sector ahead of the interests of your fossil fuel donors? Senator Hume. I thank you, Mr President. And may I first re reject the premise of that question? I should say, though, that Minister Lee, the Environment Minister, has said on multiple occasions that climate change was indeed, is indeed, the biggest threat to the reef. But the World Heritage Committee is not the forum, is not the forum to make a point about climate change. Moreover, there are more than 80 World Heritage properties that UNESCO has identified as under threat from climate change, and which we all agree is a global problem that requires a global multilateral solution. And if UNESCO had decided to list all of them, well then that policy would potentially be understandable. But the only to only pick one, one of eighty, is a subversion of process. It's a subversion of process, and this decision and the motivations behind it are indeed Order. baffling. It sends indeed a very poor message to countries not making it sends indeed a very poor message to those countries that are not making the investments in reef protection that Australia indeed is. 
Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. The new Deputy Prime Minister claims to represent rural Australia, and one of the country's most profitable regional assets is the Great Barrier Reef. With the UN recommending the reef be put on the endangered list, when will you stop digging and burning coal and gas which are killing the reef? Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Waters, for over 40 years, the Australian and the Queensland governments have been working together in a strong, cooperative approach to protecting, conserving and managing the reef. And this, included the manage this included the establishment Order. of a standalone management agency, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Authority. In 2015, Australia embarked on a new long-term adaptive planning approach to protecting the reef. And the centrepiece of that is the 35-year Reef 250 Long-Term Sustainability Plan. The Reef 2050 Plan is delivered jointly Senator between the Australian Wilson. and Queensland governments in collaboration with local governments, with traditional owners, with researchers, with industries and with communities. The World Heritage Committee asked the government to accelerate efforts to meet the targets of the Reef 2050 Plan, and we have done exactly that. The Australian and the Queensland government is investing more than $3 billion from the 2014-15 to 2023-24 to implement the Reef 2050 plan. More than $2 billion of this is from Order, the Australian Senator government, Hume. an Time unprecedented for the investment. Has expired. Senator Macdonald. So, uh, I wish to ask a question of the Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Can the minister please update the Senate on the recently announced labour force figures, especially with regard to women's employment and how the Liberal and National Government's economic plan is supporting our recovery and delivering economic opportunities for Australian women? Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Macdonald for this question. Mr. President, the Morrison government's plan to drive down unemployment in Australia is indeed working. More Australians are in a job now than before the COVID-19 pandemic and the COVID-induced recession that it brought about. Importantly, Mr. President, the Morrison government's economic plan is delivering for Australian women specifically. Recently published May workforce figures highlight that there are more women now in the workforce than ever before. Even more women in the workforce now than the record female participation rates that were achieved in April this year. Yeah. Mr. President, overall unemployment has dropped to 5.1 per cent from April to May. And the number of unemployed women has increased by 69,000 in May. 1.6 per cent above the start of Order. pandemic levels. And the good news doesn't stop there, Mr. President. Order the hours that are worked are also up, yeah. now 4.1 per cent higher for women than prior to the pandemic. And in addition, more women that want, that want additional hours are able to get them, with female Order. underemployment now 1.9 per cent lower than prior to the pandemic. And this is the lowest Senator rate Watt. in over a decade. Mr. President, Senator these Watt. are not just numbers. These are Australian women who are getting ahead. These are Australian women that are improving their lives, who are getting more hours of work than ever before. And each one of these success stories are a story, is a story of independence. It's a story of taking control and managing Order. women taking control and managing their own economic security, their own economic well-being and their future prosperity, as well as securing our economic recovery and strengthening Australia. There are few things in this world more important to women's economic security than a good job, and the Morrison Order. government is delivering on exactly that for Australian women. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. Minister, it's disappointing that those on the other side are so uninterested in women's participation. Order. I would ask you to continue to outline to the Senate the most recent women's workforce participation Order figures on my left. and what is driving them. Before I call Senator Hume, I again ask for silence during the question being asked. Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. You're right, I couldn't really hear the question, but I'll guess what it was. Mr. President, the most recent women's workforce economic, the, the recent women's workforce participation rate 
is higher than it's ever been recorded in Australia, increasing by nearly 4 per cent over the course of 2021. The latest women's workforce participation rate beats Australia's record figures from April this year. Mr President, Senator Macdonald asked Order. what might be driving this increase in economic participation. Well, Mr. President, it's the Morrison government's strong economic management that this is that this government's plan and this government's Order. plan for a stronger Australia that is delivering for Australian women. But the Morrison government is also pro providing more women with more choice by reducing the cost pressures of childcare, with even more support announced in the 2021-22 budget. Women will have the incentive to stay connected to their employer and to work that extra day or those extra hours should they wish to do so. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate of the recent gender pay gap figures and how they have changed over time? Senator Hume. I thank you, Mr. President, and I thank again Senator Macdonald. I'm very glad you asked because, I'm, because uh, the present gender pay gap is in fact at a record low, a record low of 13.4 per cent. And it's no coincidence that, this, it's, that it's coalition governments that drive the gender pay gap lower. In fact, when the coalition government left government in 2007, the gender pay gap was 15.4 per cent and on its way down. However, when the Labor came to government, they oversaw a gender pay gap that went as high as 17.4 per cent. That's right. The gender pay gap in Australia went up considerably under Labor. And it's taken a coalition government to get this figure Order. back down on the right trajectory, heading down once again. And we won't Order stop here, Mr left. President. Senators in the 2021-22 budget, Polly. we announced a targeted, review, a targeted review of the Workplace Gender Equality Agency and with the aim of pushing that gender pay gap even lower. Australians know that it's the Morrison government that delivers those opportunities for Australian women. Order. Real equality Senator is Hume. not about platitudes, Time it's about opportunity. Answer has expired. There is too much noise during answers. Seriously, Senator Ayres and Green, if I'm calling the chamber to order, Senator McAllister, and on my right, who I didn't see, if I'm calling the chamber to order, can people please be quiet and have some respect for the procedures of the chamber? Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Reynolds. Western Australia's Nationals leader, Mia Davies, has said of newly appointed Deputy Prime Minister Joyce's return, and I quote, I'm disappointed the party felt they needed to change leaders. I think it shows they're focused on internal matters instead of the people of regional Australia. Is Ms Davies correct? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank uh, the Senator for the question. Uh, can I say this is fairly and squarely a matter for the National Party uh, of Australia and not, not for government? But can I just say the Liberal National Party coalition has been an enduring one Order. for seven decades and it will continue. Uh, so it, and it will continue very strongly. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Jess Price Purnell, a former national member for 11 years and former chairwoman of the New South Wales National Women's Council, has said of Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce's return, and I quote, It's actually pretty devastating. There's only so many times you can bang your head up against a brick wall. Is Ms. Price Purnell correct? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. Can I just say that again that that is a matter for the National Party uh, from Order. all of us Senator here who sit on this side um, of the I've parliament. Got Senator, Reynolds. We... Senator Reynolds, please. I've got Senator um, O'Neill on a point of order. Order. This is the correct minister who is representing the Deputy Prime Minister, what, what is Senator the point Reynolds. Of order, she, Senator, if this Senator is how she commences representing that minister, what is the we're point of order? The point of order is this is within the, the minister's well, remit, and absorbing Senator herself Senator O'Neill, that Senator O'Neill, Senator O'Neill, again, if I'm speaking, I expect senators to be quiet. Firstly. You rose when the minister had been speaking for less than five seconds. I don't think that is a reasonable. It took me a while to get senators to be quiet, to, but it would, Senator O'Neill rose for less than five seconds into the answer, and 
I, with respect, do not think, unless there is an egregious breach of standing orders, it is appropriate to try and assert an issue of relevance, which I will assume you are trying to assert then. I am listening carefully to the minister's answer. The minister is entitled to answer in a form she sees fit, as long as she is directly relevant to the question. Senator Reynolds to continue. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And can I continue by saying that we have had an enduring partnership for seven decades, which has served Australia and particularly rural and regional Australia very well, and that will certainly continue. And can I join the Prime Minister and uh, I know all colleagues on this side for thanking Michael McCormick for his dedicated service as Deputy Prime Minister. Michael will continue to be an invaluable member of the National Party and also of our coalition. He was a passionate advocate for regional and rural communities, as will the new leader and the National Party team continue to be. Order on both sides. Senator O'Neill, a final. Senators McAllister, Polly, Brown. President. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. President. A deputy leader of the Victorian Nationals, Steph Ryan, has said, and I quote, I've never made a secret of the fact that I think Barnaby Joyce's previous actions didn't really make him eligible for the top job. Which previous actions is Ms Ryan referring to, and does the minister agree with Ms Ryan? Um, I'm, I'm going to say that the, we have— I, I, I'm going to make a rule. I'm, I'm going to make a statement on this question before I call the minister. Um, a minister can be asked about public statements of themselves that they have made that are outside their portfolio or matters relevant to the minister that they represent. That particular second supplementary question refers to a claimed quote, I'm not disputing it, from a member of the state parliament in Victoria that doesn't directly link, in my view, to the minister that, the, that Senator Reynolds represents. And so the minister, is, may, the minister can answer it to the extent that she is able to because it doesn't actually draw, in my view, to a matter here. Senator Wong, on the point of order. Yeah, on the point of order, Mr President, um, I, I, I simply make this point. Uh, this is a question to a person representing the Deputy Prime Minister, and there's obviously uh, a much broader remit when it comes to the Prime Minister or the Deputy Prime Minister, and it actually goes to the suitability of the person now occupying the job. Now, if it is your ruling that that is not relevantly a matter to be addressed to the person representing him, we accept that. I would submit it is entirely reasonable for the opposition to put to the person representing the Deputy Prime Minister whether or not he is in fact suitable um, to retain that role. I take your point, Senator Wong, and I would rule such a... I'm not ruling this question out of order. I'm just pre-empting what I might anticipate might be a point of order. If the question was phrased in the way that you put it, I would not make this observation. But my badly handwritten notes here refer to a quote from a Victorian State Member of Parliament that doesn't actually ask the Minister or Deputy Prime Minister's view on the matter. It just simply asserts... Um, and so I'll call the minister. I think it didn't use. Does the minister agree? Does it? I, okay. Um, there was another part. Yep. If I can assist, I, I accept. I understand your ruling in respect of which actions is Ms Ryan referring to. Uh, yep, so you may not have heard Senator O'Neill went on to say, "Does the minister agree with Ms okay. Ryan?" So I, I, yeah, I heard the first part, and I viewed the second part in context. The first. I'll ask the minister to respond to the question if she deems appropriate, given. Um, what I've just said. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, for that clarification. And uh, again, I just repeat that those are internal party matters uh, for the National Party of Australia, uh, not, not, uh, not ones for this side. That can I say I welcome uh, Barnaby Joyce uh, to, to the role, Senators, and also I look Senators very much forward to left. working with him and representing Senator him here White in this chamber, Green. because I know that uh, all the National Party members strongly support rural and regional Australia, and as part of this coalition government, they have delivered time and time again for rural and regional Australia in partnership with the Liberal Party in coalition. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Can the minister please inform the Senate of the importance of a seasonal workforce for our agricultural sector? in securing the economic recovery in rural and regional communities following the challenges posed by COVID. 
the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. And can I thank Senator McMahon for her question and her ongoing interest in ensuring the farmers of Australia, and particularly the farmers of the Northern Territory, have got the workforce that they need to be able to harvest their crops. Um, we know that the Australian agricultural sector Order. is an absolute economic powerhouse for this country. Um, last year alone, $66 billion generated in our rural and regional economies through our agricultural uh, exports. And our farmers and our exporters should be absolutely justifiably very proud of the achievements that they deliver on behalf of Australia, feeding 80 million people worldwide, employing 1.6 million Australians. Um, it is absolutely one of the, the absolute underlying economic drivers of the Australian economy. But as you would know, Senator McMahon, in many places around the country, we have a significant reliance on an overseas workforce in order to support our agricultural sector. In fact, um, you know, there are some places around the country where 90 per cent of the workforce actually comes from overseas. Um, through the pandemic, because of the reduction in the number of working holiday uh, makers that were in Australia falling um, quite significantly, it has absolutely highlighted the challenges that are faced by our regional communities. And that's why this government, the, the, uh, the, the Morrison-Joyce government, has put in place programs to support the agricultural sector like Ag Attract. Um, and uh, these sorts of programs um, you know, uh, together um, are able to provide the agricultural sector with the workforce, the skills, and to continue to build on its workforce to ensure that the farmers of Australia have the workforce that they need. Um, furthermore, we also introduced the National Agricultural Workers Code in September last year to facilitate mobility in the agricultural sector so that we could make sure that we get workers to be able to move across borders much more easily, um, to make sure that we were providing the workforce that the Australian, um, Australian farmers need to get their crops off and to make Order. money for Australia. Senator Rustin. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Um, unlike those opposite who have no support for agriculture whatsoever, Order. can the minister outline Order. the ways that the Liberals and Nationals government Order on is supporting left. our farmers to meet Order. their workforce needs? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, well, the, the, uh, the government of which I'm proud to be a member and of which Senator McMahon is also proud to be a member have worked extremely hard to make sure that we have programs in place so that we can support our farmers through the pandemic. And one such program is a program that's very close to the heart to both myself and Minister Payne, which is the Pacific Labor Scheme. Um, can I also acknowledge the amazing advocacy from Senator McMahon uh, and leadership on the matter to make sure that there were adequate workforce in the Northern Territory to make sure that your Order. mango crop got picked this year. You were faced with a crisis, you yeah. came to us and yeah. we were able to solve the problem by bringing in a number of people from Vanuatu to enable the crop in, Queens, uh, in the Northern Territory to be picked. Uh, that happened back in September and it was a great success. In addition to that, um, the government has introduced the uh, Agricultural Workers Code to make sure, as I said, that the state borders were open. And we also moved to, uh, to introduce Ag Move to provide support to people to move to the Order. country Senator to Rustin, support our Senator agricultural McMahon, sector. Senator final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How will the recently announced agricultural visa further assist farmers to meet their workforce requirements now and into the future, in Order. addition to existing Order highly successful labour mobility arrangements. Order on my left during the questions. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, the new agricultural visa arrangements will be very important in putting in place a, a, a workforce for our agricultural sector to play an absolutely essential role in delivering the workers that we all need, know on this side are needed for us to be able to pick our crops. Um, you know, the success of the, of the Pacific Workers Scheme has demonstrated how these sorts of programs are able to supplement the workforce for our agricultural sector to make sure that we're able to get the crops off. I mean, currently in Australia at the moment we have um, over 12,000 uh, people from the Pacific and Temeleste uh, to help and, and more are on their way. The government is currently consulting with stakeholders uh, on the streamlining of these programs to make sure that they work even better to make sure that 
our, work, our agricultural workforce is there so that we can pick the crops, we can harvest the fruit and make sure that we're providing the food not just to Australia but to the rest of the world, the clean, green, world-class produce that Australian farmers are so famous for. Order. Senator Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister Payne. Three weeks ago, you stated you were seized of the matter of urgently processing visas for Afghan civilians who put their lives at risk working for the Australian government, including the Defence Force, Foreign Affairs and AusAid, during Australia's longest war in Afghanistan. Since the ADF's departure from southern Afghanistan in 2013, at least nine of the local civilians who work for AusAid's flagship stability and, re and development project in that province have been murdered by the Taliban. Australian civilians were targeted for working on it, and Afghani civilians are being murdered for it. Will the government approve visas and conduct emergency evacuation for Afghan contractors and their families whose lives are in terrible danger from Taliban reprisals? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Lambie for her, uh, her question. Uh, Senator, as you're, uh, Senator, through you, Mr. President, uh, as you're aware, this program has been uh, underway uh, since 2012. A special humanitarian visa program uh, has seen over 1,400 visas offered uh, since the program began. Uh, referring to your more specific or more um, recent uh, questions in relation to uh, the last period of time, uh, we have granted over 186 visas since April this year, uh, so in the last six or seven weeks, uh, Senator Lambie. Uh, this is uh, absolutely a priority for the Australian government supporting those locally engaged uh, employees who have supported Australia's mission in Afghanistan, as you have said. Uh, many of them have given an enormous amount and they have worked under very difficult circumstances. So what we are doing is working swiftly across agencies. It involves the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the Department of Defence and the Department of Home Affairs uh, to ensure each case is considered and those who are at risk of harm who meet the visa requirements are resettled to Australia as soon as possible. Senator Lambie, in terms of the uh, transport and the movement of those uh, applicants who are successful, uh, the International Organisation for Migration, the IOM, uh, and the Australian departments and agencies uh, work to both transport and assist those Afghanis who assisted us. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Just yesterday, your department rejected the visa application for a site manager of this project, who is now in hiding and receiving constant threats from the Taliban. They've already made multiple attempts on his life. What kind of danger does he need to be in in order for his life to be considered worth saving? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Each case uh, is examined uh, and considered in terms of the uh, the individual's experience, experience in terms of the role they held with Australian uh, forces and Australian uh, staff. Uh, each locally engaged employee uh, has a number of factors taken into account and a number of things that need to be considered in what are difficult circumstances. Identity, the accuracy of their claim of employment, the risk to the individual. Uh, for my part, as the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the advice that the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade provides to me on the validity of the application. And then, if they are agreed, uh, I am in a position to certify that the application should be considered by Home Affairs, which is something I have done both in this role, Senator Lambie, and in my previous role as the Minister for Defence. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Absolutely shameful that your old coalition has had seven years to get this job done. The world is watching how we treat our mates here. What kind of message does it send to the rest of the world that when you work with the Australian government, you're taking your life into your own hands? Senator Payne. Senator Lambie, I understand that, uh, that these are issues which are deeply, con deeply felt, uh, including by you. Over the last number of years, as I set out in my first response, uh, more than 1,400 visas have been issued since the program began. Uh, and in terms of applications that have been received in the, in the recent period, 186 visas have been granted since April of this year, Senator. Uh, there are a number of other locally engaged staff and families who have applied for visas. They are in the process of being certified. 
and being assessed, and then they will be assisted if they qualify under the, uh, the uh, regulation, Senator. This is a very, very important process. We take it very seriously. Uh, we deeply appreciate the support provided to us by Afghani locals in both Order. the uh, in both the context that you have raised and in terms of assistance to the Australian Defence Force. Uh, that is why 1,400 visas have been issued since the program began, and it is why we are continuing that process Order. as Senator of right Payne. now. Senator Mariel Smith. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Just hours after rolling the Deputy Prime Minister, the Nationals in the Senate split with the Morrison government, voting to walk away from the Murray-Darling Basin plan. When did the minister first become aware the junior coalition partner no longer supports the implementation of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan in full and on time? The minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, uh, and thank you very much, um, Senator Smith, for, for your question. Well, um, the government policy remains that we are absolutely supporting of making sure that we have a sustainable Murray-Darling Basin system going into the future for all Australians that rely on it. And that means that the communities that are along the river, the farmers that, that grow the, the produce and the fibre as a result of the use of that water, uh, whether it be um, you know, Australians who rely on it as a, as a source of drinking water, as it, it is in the case uh, in South Australia, where, where I live uh, and where Senator Smith lives as well. It is absolutely essential that we have a, a sustainable river system going into the future. And that's why, 12 years ago, we came together in this place in a bipartisan agreement to make sure that we delivered for a, uh, a sustainable system. And that's when we put an absolutely once-in-a-generation opportunity, put together Order. a plan. I mean, this is probably one of the most ambitious water uh, plans or ambitious um, environmental and agricultural combined plans that has ever been agreed to in this place. Fourteen chambers of governments around Australia agreed to the implementation of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, and I pay tribute to everybody in this place. Uh, whether they're here today, uh, we're back, and we're here when the plan was first put into place, or whether they've left this place now and other par uh, parliaments around Australia for having the foresight to realise the importance of this, uh, this plan, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. And as we go forward, we know that we will have challenges to make sure that we continue to work together collectively to deliver the plan on behalf of all Australians. But the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, and none of us should shy away, has got some very significant complaints. Complexities, but that doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't all be working towards making sure that we continue to deliver the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. And we will continue to put new initiatives in place, applying um, innovative solutions about how we can get more water to our environmental sites. Order. But at the same Senator time, Senator Rustin, time for the answer has expired. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. When Mr Joyce was last the Deputy Prime Minister, he declared the water promised under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan didn't have a hope in Hades of being delivered. Is abandoning the Murray-Darling Basin Plan the position of the Morrison-Joyce government? Senator Rustin. The uh, position of the Morrison government is absolutely commitment to the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Um, and just because, just because uh, we put on, you know, put on the record that there are some difficulties and complexities in delivering such a complicated and, and complex plan as the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, does not mean in any way that this government has moved away from its commitment for the delivery of the plan for all Australians. Whether, as I said, they're not, not just Australians that live in the cities, but the Australians that live along the Murray-Darling Basin. The, the communities that rely on the water, the farmers that rely on the water for their livelihoods, and the full infrastructure of rural and regional Australia in the Murray-Darling Basin catchment area to make sure that they continue into the future to be able to get access to water to support their communities. So the, the, the position and the commitment of this government has not changed. We are absolutely 100 per cent committed to the delivery of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and for the benefit of our farmers and the communities that live along the river. Order. as well as those in the city. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Mr Joyce has never supported the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. He famously once told South Australians to move to where the water is. Will the minister recommit to implementing the Murray-Darling Basin Plan in full and on time? Senator Rustin. 
Well, I don't need to recommit to anything because we've never moved away from our commitment, Senator Smith. Um, now, there, there are many people who have Order. made many, many comments in relation to the difficulties in being able to deliver this really ambitious plan. But that doesn't Order. change. That does not change the commitment of this government to remain absolutely focused on the delivery of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. And we will continue to work with jurisdictions because, as I said, this is a plan for all Australians and all states that sit within the basin. This is not just the federal government, it's the Queensland government, the ACT government, the New South Wales government, the Victorian government and the South Australian government. We will continue to work together to deliver the plan because every single state knows that the, the outcome of not delivering the plan is absolutely a negative outcome for their states and, uh, and their territories. So we remain committed to that. So any suggestion whatsoever that we have moved away from our commitment to the delivery of the Murray Darling Basin Plan is factually incorrect. Senator Betts. Well done. Senator Betts. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for International Development and the Pacific. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Liberal National Government is responding to the health and economic challenges posed by COVID-19 in our region and how this supports our own health security and economic recovery? Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we're all very aware of the devastation that COVID is causing around the world, with around 10,000 deaths a day. Um, serious outbreaks in our region, of course, threaten both uh, our region's uh, health and security and, of course, Australia's health and security and our economy. And that's why we've uh, pivoted our aid program to respond, and we've added uh, $1 billion in additional COVID-19 related spending to help our region weather the storm. Now, this year, we are providing record funding of nearly $1.7 billion to the Pacific, 50 per cent higher than when Labor was last in office. And to help contain uh, Fiji's current outbreak, we've already provided 250,000 Australian vaccines. At least 750,000 more will follow. Now, yesterday, a joint Australian and New Zealand medical assistance team arrived in Fiji, and our support has helped Fiji to maintain its world-class levels of testing and contract, contact tracing. In PNG, Australia has reprioritised well over $100 million to support PNG's COVID-19 response and provided an additional $52 million in targeted financing for critical health and education services. And this is in addition to providing PNG uh, with OSMAT teams, Australian vaccines and substantial supplies of personal protective equipment to bolster COVID, uh, PNG's COVID-19 response. And nowhere is the threat to Australia more acute than in the Torres Strait. Uh, so vaccinating the communities on both sides of the Torres Strait is critical to Australia's health security. On the Australian side, almost 95 per cent of the eligible population on Australia's outer islands of Saibai, Boigu and Darwin have received their first dose of vaccines. And with Australian support, Western Province is currently PNG's third best performing province in vaccine delivery, a remarkable achievement given its geography. Uh, the government remains absolutely focused on protecting Australians from COVID-19 at every level, globally, Order. regionally, Senator domestically Selja. and Senator on our borders. Abetz, a supplementary question. I thank the Minister for that interesting answer and ask further, can the Minister outline the government's efforts to provide vaccines to our neighbours and how this supports regional health security? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you. And, and, and our Prime Minister recently said uh, that uh, helping to vaccinate uh, the Pacific is both a moral and an economic necessity, and indeed it is. And that's why we've committed more than $750 million to supporting vaccine access for our region. We're delivering this through four pathways. $130 million for the COVAX facility, which has already distributed over 15 million doses to Southeast Asia and the Pacific. $523 million to help countries in the Pacific and Southeast Asia access and roll out vaccines, and $100 million under the Quad Vaccine Partnership focusing on last mile delivery. And finally, and most directly, from Australia's own supply, we will share at least 20 million doses in our region. We've already delivered almost 360,000 doses, including 250,000 to Fiji, 70,000 to Timor-Leste, 
uh, almost 19,000 at PNG, 13,000 to the Solomons, 7,000 to Tuvalu. Australia is leading the delivery of vaccines across the Pacific for the health, security Order. and prosperity Senator of Australia Time and of our the region. Has expired. Senator Abetz, a final supplementary question. Can the minister update the Senate on how the government is otherwise supporting economic stability and resilience in our region? Senator Seselja. I will thank you. And, and COVID-19, of course, poses extraordinary economic risks to our region. To support regional stability, including our own, the Australian government is stepping up our economic response. Across the Pacific, we are delivering over $300 million in grant funding to support economic recovery. Uh, nearly $200 million of this has already been delivered. In Fiji, we're bolstering social protection schemes for the most vulnerable. In Timor-Leste, we're building water systems, roads, bridges, health clinics and schools. Our work has also enabled the restart of the Pacific Labor Scheme to help Australian farmers and Pacific economies. Uh, nearly 8,000 Pacific workers have arrived in Australia since September 2020, and our loan financing is taking effect too. Just last week, we signed financing agreements with the Solomon Islands government for the Tina River transmission system. Our support, worth approximately $60 million in total, will help deliver renewable energy to Honiara. This is vital work uh, that is supporting our regions and our nation's economic recovery. Senator Faruqi. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Reynolds. An investigation by the nine newspapers found Australia's 50 wealthiest private schools now have assets worth $8.5 billion. This grew by more than 40 per cent over just four years. The investigation also found the combined surpluses for those top 50 schools was almost $400 million in 2019, while still receiving public funding Order for more than right. $620 million in the same year. Minister, why does the government continue to overfund these obscenely rich private schools that are running surpluses and accumulating enormous wealth? The Minister representing the Minister for Education and Youth, Senator Reynolds. Oh, well, thank you very much, um, thank you very much uh, Mr President, and thank you very much, Senator Faruqi, for that question. Can I just say there is nothing further from the truth. This government is not abandoning any student, any school, and never will. The federal government has clear responsibilities, as do state and territories. Now, for the first now, um, the DMI method gives a more accurate of capacity of families to contribute to the cost of non-government schooling. This ensures that Commonwealth funding is better targeted and it is fairer. The move to DMI will result in an estimated additional $3.2 billion in funding for non-government schools using the new method, uh, were it done in May 2020. So from 2022, all schools will have their funding adjusted according to the capacity of their school community to contribute as assessed under this new methodology. The government has put in place a range of supports to assist non-government schools with the transition to DMI school funding. Now, these arrangements include the, uh, the financially best socio-economic stated SES score uh, or the new DMI score funding in 2020 and 2021. Secondly, a gradual transition through to 2029 for schools transitioning downward to their share of schooling resource standards. And thirdly, an extra $1.2 billion from 2020 to 2029 for non-government schools through the Choice and Availability Fund. And fourthly, what we are doing is establishing a robust review process to address unexpected or unique circumstances affecting the financial capacity of a school's community. The fund includes requirements that non-government representative bodies provide a specific level of support to transition regional and remote schools, and also, secondly, it con to a consolidated annual report on the expenditure to ensure accountability and transparency. So, this government's record beats that of any Order. other Senator government, Reynolds, particularly those the on the other side. In real Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, under current funding arrangements, private schools will be overfunded by $6 billion from now until 2029, and public schools will be underfunded to $58 billion over the same period. The Choice and Affordability Slush Fund will dish out more than $100 million every year to private schools, while public schools are completely locked out. Minister, what on earth happened to needs-based funding? Senator Reynolds. 
Uh, look, thank you very much again for that question. And can I just say, the truth and the facts matter. And let me share with all of those in this chamber about the truth of this matter. So, first of all, funding comparisons Order for government and non-government schools, 2013 to 2022. The Commonwealth funding for government schools has doubled. In fact, just over doubled, 100.7% since 2013, and we'll see a further increase uh, to 2029 of 46%. The facts matter, and we have funded government schools more than those on the other side of this chamber ever, ever did. Order on my Additionally, left. from 2013 to 2019, to, from 2029, government schools funding will have increased by 192 per cent. This government, since 2013 to 2029, will have nearly provided a 200 per cent increase for government schools. Order, Senator Reynolds. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Minister, last, last month's budget revealed that private schools are set to receive over $20 billion more federal money than public schools over the next four years. And this government seems to be hell-bent on exacerbating the funding inequalities between private and public schools. Minister, why is the government con continuing to betray more than two and a half million public school students and thousands of under-resourced and underpaid public school teachers? Senator Reynolds. Well, again, that is simply not true, Mr. President. So, Senator Faruqi talks about individual students. Let me tell you what the figures are for individual students under this government. Since 2013 to 2022, Commonwealth funding per student in government schools has increased by nearly 80 per cent since 2013, and we'll see a further increase of 72.2 per cent to 2029. Commonwealth funding per student for non-government schools has grown by 53.6 per cent since 2013, and still will increase but see a further increase of 53.6% to 2029. Additionally, from 2013 to 2029, government school funding per student will have increased by 127%, 127% per child. And again, in comparison, from 2023, sorry, 13 to 2029, non-government school funding Order. will have increased Senator by 81%. Senator, Senator Birmingham. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Mr. President. Well, much as I'd like to hear more about record funding for Australian schools, yeah, yeah. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Well Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator McAllister. Note of the answers given by Senators Hume and Seselja to the questions asked by Senator Gallagher and I. Well, it's reported that in 2019 Mr Joyce made an intriguing uh, contribution to his Facebook page, and I invite senators to really think about what these words could possibly mean. But he, he wrote this: "One of the few graces of being on the back bench is you can be honest with what your views really are." I believe this is one of the greatest policy phantoms, the misguided and quite ludicrous proposition that Australia can have any effect on the climate. If we could, we should be the first to make it rain and, more importantly, stop the recurrence of an ice age any time in the coming millennium. Well, obviously a very important contribution just a few years ago from Mr Joyce, but the thing is that those are now no longer the views of a humble backbencher, are they? They are the views of the leader of the National Party and the Deputy Prime Minister of this country. Now, he's actually yet to unveil his plan to stop the recurrence of an ice age, and I look forward to his announcements. But his opposition to acting on climate change is on full display. He has said this. The Nationals have always been opposed to a net zero target. If the Nationals supported net zero emissions, we would cease to be a party that could credibly represent farmers. Well, it's going to be news to the farmers, isn't it? Because the body actually constituted to represent farmers, the National Farmers Federation, do support net zero. 
But it's certainly Mr Joyce's view, and he hasn't been quiet about it at all. He hasn't. And on a day when the vast majority of Australians, in a poll that's out today, have confirmed their very strong preference for investment in renewables, it's worth considering his views on that question. He said, what is this insane, lemming-like desire to go to renewables going to do to our economy? If you want zero emissions, nuclear power does it. So my question to the moderates in the Liberal Party, and I'm pleased to see that there's a couple of them remaining in the chamber. It's one just leaving now. What are you going to do about it? You're not the one we're talking about. Dr. Katie Allen has said that she will be a strong voice in the party room for stronger action on climate change. She says, I have been and will continue to be a strong voice for climate action inside the tent. I'm working on influencing that agenda. We need to have higher ambition to lead the world in renewables. Well, is Dr Allen going to be a stronger voice as Mr Joyce? Mr Dave Sharma, a man who understands all too well the fury of a Liberal electorate that's been betrayed on climate change, has said that, and I quote, Australia needs to be acting with a higher level of ambition. And he's also said we should be doing more to address climate change. We've allowed something that should really be a conventional policy challenge to become a kind of culture and values issue. It shouldn't be the third rail of Australian politics. Well, what is Mr Sharma going to do? What is Mr Sharma's plan? Mr Trent Zimmerman. What's he got to say? He told Fairfax that Australians want us to get on with the job of meeting our Paris emissions, but looking at what more we can do to reduce our emissions further. What will Mr Zimmerman have? What will he do to have the government commit to reducing emissions further than what was agreed at Paris? Because that's the challenge, isn't it? It's the challenge for Mr Zimmerman. It's the challenge for Mr Allen. It's Mr. My apologies, Dr Allen. It's a challenge for Mr Sharma. And it's a challenge for others, like Mr Falinski, Mr Wilson, Mr Evans and Ms Cecilia Hammond. And it's a challenge for those in this place too, isn't it? Like Senator Hume, Senator Payne, Senator Patterson, Senator Bragg and Senator Birmingham, who once, once held the portfolio of environment. Well, we know that there are people remaining in the Liberal Party who do believe that humans are driving dangerous climate change. And Senator Birmingham is quite welcome to get up and confirm his support for that if he'd like to. We know there are people who support real action on emissions and moderate Liberal parliamentarians who have made a public commitment to that, not just here but to their electorates. Well, all those people, they've given a nod and a wink. You've all told your electorates that when the time comes, you'll stand up for their interests. All those people out there in your electorates who actually want you to do something about climate change. The Deputy Prime Minister is now a man who is more worried about a coming ice age than he is about global warming. What will you do to keep your promise to the people who have supported you? Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Abetz. As a modern liberal with traditional values, I'm delighted to partake in this debate. Because what Senator McAllister and colleagues opposite have forgotten is that they self-describe the last election as the climate change election which they lost. Why did they lose that election? Because the Australian people sided with a coalition because it had the sensible policy in this area. The extreme policies of the Australian Labor Party were rejected by the Australian people. And here they are seeking to re-prosecute the case of the last election, which they so comprehensively failed. And we on this side were blessed with the support of the Australian people because of our sensible approach. This is yet again, Madam Deputy President, the Australian Labor Party saying to the Australian people, you got it wrong. The Australian people, I suggest, got it right as they do, and what I would invite the Labor Party to do is have a look at their policies and understand why they lost the last election. And indeed, somebody that might help them in that regard might be the member for, is it Hunter? Mr Fitzgibbon, uh, Joel Fitzgibbon. He has certain views that are not necessarily mainstream within the Australian Labor Party these days. 
but they're very popular. They're very popular on the ground, I must say. So I'm very thankful that Mr Fitzgibbon has been frozen out of the Australian Labor Party. But we on this side, we celebrate diversity of views. We do celebrate that differing people will, in good faith, come to a position with different considerations. We ought to celebrate that in a democracy. And the fact that uh, Mr Joyce, the newly, re or newly uh, appointed Deputy Prime Minister, has expressed certain views. But uh, let me remind those opposite that everybody on this side is absolutely convinced that trying to reduce emissions by as much as possible makes good sense. Good environmental stewardship is something that we all believe in. But something we won't believe in is the sort of nonsense that the Australian Labor Party used to fund. Who was that fellow that was your climate change ambassador, Professor Flannery or somebody, who said time and time again, we are in a drought paradigm. The Brisbane River would never flood again. They paid him $180,000 per annum for was it two days a week for these prognostications. Well, after he made those profound prophecies, the Brisbane River flooded once and twice with loss of life and property, completely debunking his assertions. Another one of his assertions that Labor funded was that the Murray River would never flow out to sea again. As Senator Birmingham from South Australia would know, the Murray River has flowed back out to sea again. Oh, but the Labor Party, despite the objective evidence that is there for all to see, whether you like it or not, the Brisbane River has flooded twice since that prophecy. The Murray River has flown out to sea since that prophecy. Has Professor Flannery ever apologised? Have the Australian Labor Party ever apologised for unnecessarily scaring the Australian people? Of course not. Because it doesn't matter if it's environmental, if it's Medicare, they are into the scare campaigns trying to scare people into voting for them. We on this side have practical policies not scaring people to vote for us, but actually them coming to an understanding that we are on their side, that we actually support their aspirations. We want the very best for our country. And that is why. And that is why good environmental stewardship, as shown by the coalition, the Liberal and National Party together in lockstep, has delivered for the Australian people, and the Australian people in return have very kindly delivered for the coalition in the ballot box. And here we are with the Australian Labor Party trying to re-prosecute their failed election campaign of 2019. And I suggest to those on the other side, get with a program, the program of the Australian people, which is let's do something about good environmental stewardship, but don't over-egg it. Thank you, Senator Abbott. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Well, Senator Hume and Senator Zazelja might try and do their best to paper over the enormous cracks now in the coalition on climate change policy, cracks that have been there all along, but which have really come to the fore, absolutely decimating any credibility the government has in this space. While Prime Minister Scott Morrison last week was out and about in the G7 in the UK trying to spruik Australia's climate change credentials, what's actually underfoot uh, was underfoot here was, as we know, Barnaby Joyce, who doesn't support the very target that the Prime Minister was spruiking, returned now as Australia's Deputy Prime Minister. And so when Senator Humes asked about Susan Lee uh, this morning on RN, she refused to guarantee that Mr Morrison's preference that he's just put forward on the world stage, trying to rehabilitate our credibility, that those targets would survive Barnaby Joyce's return as Deputy Prime Minister. She simply said, we will have discussions with the nationals. And what does Barnaby say? Barnaby doesn't come out straight forth and say, oh, 
I don't believe in um, climate Senator change Pratt, targets. Senator Pratt, I do remind you to refer to uh, others in the other place by their correct titles. Mr Joyce doesn't say uh, I'll, I'll just uh, announce my new climate change target. No, he says, oh, I'll listen to the National Party. But indeed, what do we know that the National Party thinks? As we've heard time and time again in this place, as they've always done, they don't support these targets. <coughs> but to be honest, this puts them completely out of step with their own constituency. It's little wonder to me that the National Party has no federal seats <coughs> in Western Australia. Uh, the WA Farmers uh, president, Rhys Turton, he said on record, we understand climate change is real, that it's affecting farms in Western Australia <coughs> and that it needs a whole world approach. Australian agriculture has an equal and equitable obligation. <coughs> I'm, so I'm sorry, Mrs. Depp, I can't. <coughs> Thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, I think you're right, Senator Pratt. Okay, thank you, um, Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much. I am. Uh, I don't know whether to be uh, pleased or vaguely concerned at the opposition's obsession with the National Party and during question time, the calling out and the discussion with the National Party, uh, the number of questions focused on the National Party. And, and I guess what it is is a reflection of how the National Party continues to bat well above its weight in terms of its influence and its, uh, uh, and its contribution to the national debate. Uh, but we will have to continue to listen to the uh, op opposition's uh, complete focus on what the National Party does and think at every turn. Uh, and today we're going to discuss the National Party's position on sensible climate targets and practices. Now, I'm really proud to be a part of a government that believes in practical environmental programs and outcomes. And the target of 2030, which Australia has engaged with and already done so well on, is a great reflection. Uh, and I want to talk too about the great work that's done around the Great Barrier Reef catchments, where we had uh, a 25 per cent reduction in nitrogen output uh, on the basis of the very practical changes made by Queensland cane farmers. They have done a terrific job of adopting new practices of innovation in both mechanical and, uh, and farming practices. And well may those on the other side bury their heads in their hands because that's how they operate. They don't understand farming. They don't understand the practical realities of being able to balance the environment with good environmental outcomes. Because you cannot do good things for the environment when you trash jobs and you trash industry, because that is what Labor would have done if they had been successful in their uh, desire to form government after the last election. Their policies would have meant that their high taxes and their crippling policies on farming, uh, on industry, would have left tens of thousands of Australians out of work out of work and wondering how they transition. We all remember uh, Jackie Trad's policies on transitioning coal miners to, I don't know, maybe coffee jobs or uh, perhaps tourism uh, in their coal areas. And so these are the sort of practical uh, environmental and uh, economic balances that we in the National Party consider, because we do understand the regions, we understand the important work that happens in the regions. Uh, and I, I can't begin to imagine what would have happened if, uh, if the opposition, who continue to uh, take this kind of moralising, uh, anti-National Party stance, would come to if they were in government. 
So, uh, if we're going to talk about uh, emissions targets, I think we have quite practically and reasonably uh, decided to discuss how technology and innovation will be able to achieve the environmental outcomes that the world is talking about. And certainly uh, in mining, there is a number of programs and projects that are happening that will allow that industry uh, to have greater control over their emissions uh, through changes to uh, practices around uh, mining practices, around fuel in trucks, around tailing stamps. Uh, and in the agricultural sector, well, of course, we know that agriculture has already borne the, gr the great brunt of these uh, changes with the introduction of the draconian uh, vegetation management laws in Queensland. And the loss of property rights for uh, uh, Queensland farmers has been quite dramatic. But that industry has continued to go on and make uh, innovation and practical changes to both uh, their land management, to um, genetics in animals, to incredible changes to crops uh, like cotton, which uses less fertiliser and pesticides, less water and yet can achieve greater yields. So these are the kind of practical outcomes that means that we still have jobs in the regions, we still have successful industries uh, and we don't uh, smash Australian jobs as Labor would have us do it. McDonald, Senator Green. Thank you, um, Deputy President. Uh, it's very interesting that the Nationals get up here and wonder why they're being criticised. And it's clear that the Nationals would like to have things both ways. They'd like to uh, be in government but not be criticised for their decisions. They'd like to be in government but not be responsible for governing the country. So when we're here and we're asking what the government's policy is, we are asking what the government's policy, the Morrison-Joyce government's policy is on net zero. And what we got from the ministers opposite today was nothing short of confusion. Because what the national spill did yesterday was launch this country into confusion and chaos. And if anyone thinks that this was just a routine shifting of the chairs, well, let's just wait and see what happens over the next couple of weeks. Because here in question time today, they weren't able to answer simple questions about what the government's policy is. These are the people running the country, and they can't tell us what their policies are when it comes to net zero emissions. Because we know that the national spill was all about selfishness and self-interested people. Self-interested people who are out there protecting their own job, but not protecting the jobs of everyday Australians. They're particularly not protecting the jobs of the regional Australians that they say that they stand up for. They say that this is all about jobs, but it is about their own jobs. It is about making sure that Mr Joyce returns as Deputy Prime Minister, that his salary goes up while wages are going down for everybody else. This was about returning uh, Senator McKenzie to the front bench, someone who resigned after the sports rorts affair. After the sports rorts affair. And yet we know, we know that nobody else in this government has been held accountable for anything that they have done. We need to know what the Nationals' coalition agreement will be and what is in it. And if they don't make it public, then there's a good reason why. They say that they care about jobs, but if they really cared about jobs, if the Nationals and the Liberals really cared about jobs in regional Queensland, then they would do something to ensure that workers that get paid the same, do the same job get paid the same wage. It's very simple. They have done nothing to stop rampant labour hire bringing down the wages of people in regional Queensland. If they cared about jobs, as they say they do in regional Queensland, and we had the minister today talking about investment in re renewable energy, then why did the government, why did Minister Pitt, veto a wind farm in far north Queensland that would have created 250 jobs, 250 jobs in a region that has been smashed by COVID, that needs these jobs right now. 
It's because they don't care about people living in far north Queensland. They don't care about people living in regional Queensland. They only care about their own jobs. And if they really cared about the jobs in regional Queensland, then they would do something to protect the Great Barrier Reef. I know it's very inconvenient for the Great Barrier Reef to also be located in regional Queensland for the Nationals and for the Liberal ministers that stood up today, but those are regional jobs too. And the Great Barrier Reef supports 64,000 jobs around Queensland, and we need to protect the jobs that rely on the reef. The net zero policy may have been an instigator for the national spill, and that's why we're asking questions about it today. But I just want to remind the Senate that yesterday there was an emergency national cabinet meeting to sort out the bungled vaccine rollout. And while that national cabinet meeting was happening, Members of the government, national members of the government, were out there rolling their leader. As that meeting was taking place, members of the government were rolling the Deputy Prime Minister. They should be rolling out the vaccine. People across this country do not know when they are going to get the vaccine. They don't know how much vaccine the government has. They need to make sure that there's certainty out there. So instead of rolling people in your own government, why don't you roll out the vaccine? Instead of, instead of fighting each other, do as you have been saying that you are doing. Fight the virus. Go out there and help Australians get through this COVID crisis instead of creating a crisis of your own government that is going to leave this country in more chaos, in more crisis you, at Senator a time Green. when we your can time least has afford expired. it. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Callister to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Lambie. Uh, Madam Deputy President, I quickly seek leave to table a document in support of my questions. Oh. Senator Lamb, we're still doing taking note. If we, but is leave granted? Is leave granted? Yes. Thanks. So we'll come back to that after the next taking note contributor. If the Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, yes, I, I rise to take note of uh, responses in relation to Senator Waters' question to the Environment uh, Minister. Um, this government, this climate-denying government, this government that is pro-fossil fuels in time of a climate emergency, this government that's had no policy on climate action for the last eight years that it's been in power, this government must have been the only government the only group of individuals on this planet that was surprised last night when UNESCO Hello. declared Hello. the Great Barrier Reef in danger. They must have been the only people surprised. And let me tell you the lengths they have gone to to avoid the World Heritage Committee declaring the values of one of the world's great icons this precious living organism that can be seen from space. Let me tell you about the lengths they have gone to to avoid this endangered listing. Not only am I aware of direct ministerial in intervention with the World Heritage Committee over many years, bureaucratic interventions in relation to whether climate change would be included in the deliberations of the committee, but a Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, gave $444 million to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation in order to avoid a World Heritage in danger listing for the reef. That is the lengths this government has gone to to avoid this. The big question is why? Why is this government so hell-bent on a day like today when everybody can see the reef's in danger? It's lost half its coral cover in the last five years. The magnificent habitat for thousands of marine creatures has crumbled and died. Why is this government not wanting to admit this? Why is this government lashing out to everyone today, blaming the Chinese Communist Party for this? Heaven forbid. Why is this government going to these lengths? Well, obviously, because it makes them a global embarrassment. As a custodian, of this internationally recognised and loved 
ecosystem this government has failed because, as the World Heritage Committee pointed out, it has not taken climate action seriously. This government is a global embarrassment and a disgrace, and I'm glad the international community has called them out. Sorry, I've got to I've got to put the question on the previous motion. The question is the motion moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to take note of the answer of the minister to my question about private school funding. Well, it's clear that the government has no interest in properly funding our public schools. The nine investigation published this month was only the latest evidence that this government continues to overfund private schools that are incredibly wealthy to begin with. Um, that are educating the most privileged communities and have also been accumulating immensely valuable assets, running big surpluses and making a mockery of the government's ostensible commitment to fairer school funding. The investigation findings are obscene. The government continues to overfund the likes of these 50 schools, which share $8.5 billion of assets. The government is not even taking this extraordinary wealth into account when deciding funding arrangements. Make no mistake, the current funding arrangements are cooked. Recent analysis from Save Our Schools found that over the last decade, federal and state government funding for private schools increased by more than six times that of public schools. Per student funding for each private school student increased by more than 22 per cent, compared to just 2.4 per cent for public school students. My office recently spoke with a public school teacher in Sydney who lamented that there were only two printers for a school with many hundreds of students. Teachers are buying stationery for their students from their own money. It's a very common story, and poor, fun and poor funding cannot be separated from chronic problems with staffing. When teachers called in sick at this particular school, usually there were no casuals available to cover them. Classes would simply be merged and become bigger to accommodate more students that day. It's simply untenable and symptomatic of a completely broken system. It's time the government and Labour woke up to the reality that our public schools are in crisis. It's time to properly fund our public schools. The question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it.